is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. Oh, I will rejoice and be glad in it.
Lord, that's our prayer is that the praises from around the world would join together and fill the air, glorifying you. So we thank you for this time. Bless our time together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. All right, let's continue with our online service. Well, hey, if we haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Odalis. I'm part of the pastoral team here at Cornerstone SF. I'm so grateful I get to chat with you for just a couple of minutes before we receive the message from Pastor Terry. This Healthy Love series has been so good. It's been so encouraging, so strengthening, so challenging to consider what it looks like to live as a person loved. Uh, and I encourage you, if, you know, if you've missed some of the messages, maybe you're tuning in for the first time, we've got them all available on our YouTube channel. They're there organized in that Sunday services playlist, and I really want to encourage you to listen to them. They have been so meaningful for so many of us, and I pray the same is the case for you. As we're in this Easter season, I also want to invite you to a couple of things we have coming up. First is our Good Friday service on April 7th. This is such a special service for us in the year. It's a slow service where we contemplate the cross, where we really consider the implications for our lives, for what Christ did, not just as a moment in the past in history, but a real-time impact on our day to day. We receive worship. Uh, we worship together and we receive communion. And it's just a beautiful time. It'll be live in person at the Mission Campus. If you're local, we'd love to see you here. If not, we'll also be live streaming it for everybody who can't make it. Then just a couple days later, it's Easter and you know we love to celebrate Easter. We have prepared a original immersive Easter musical that we cannot wait. Did I already say it? We can't wait to share it. It's called From Where I Sit. And through this presentation, we're going to be sitting with the stories of people who may not seem so different from us. In fact, some of these stories might sound a little bit like our own. They might sound like that person who sits next to us in church or some of our family members and friends. And what do we do when we think about our, our real-time story, the, the story that's being written even now and what Jesus wants to do in those places? We believe there's something beautiful there and we cannot wait to share it together. We also love to throw a good party. So keep track of these details real quick. We've also got an Easter website with all the information. At our Reardon campus, we're gonna be doing two services at 9.30 and 11.30. And after the 11.30 service, we're throwing a block party in the neighborhood, food trucks, Mr. Softy, lots of activities for the kids. There's also childcare kids ministry will be fully available at the 11.30 service. So families take notes. Online community, we have not forgotten about you. We're also preparing this entirely for you. It will be recorded and prepared, especially with you in mind, so that you have a beautiful and we pray powerful Easter moment as well. I really want to encourage you to be thinking and praying about your friends and family members who may need a touch of love at this Easter season, who maybe haven't thought about Easter, or maybe they need to hear about it in a way that they haven't before. These Easter presentations that we do are not just for us to enjoy and celebrate, though they certainly are that, but they are designed for us to share about the beautiful and life-changing work that God does in each of our lives and is offering to do now for every single one of us. So we want to encourage you to be bold in your invitations. Again, all the information for Easter is going to be on our website, and now I'm going to hand it off to Pastor Terry for him to share today's message, which is about a healthy love that covers and protects. But if you don't mind, I would love to pray over us as we prepare to receive it. Lord God, we come before you in gratitude for this moment, Lord, and reminding ourselves of your love. It's a love that does not run, a love that doesn't quit, a love that doesn't hold any condition, Lord, a love that covers us, a love that protects us, God, a love that is present in high and low. It's not a love that we can even box in or fully understand, Lord, but your great love that goes to every length to capture our hearts and to invite us into a full and deep and meaningful life. Lord, so we pray for that love over us as we hear this message together. And we pray these things in the good and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, let's receive this message now from Pastor Terry.
All right, what a blessing to be able to share this time together with all of you, my friends, near and far, wherever you are. Some of you joining us for the very first time, some of you longtime participants in the Cornerstone Online community, wherever you are. I'm happy you're with us right now. Whoever you are, I want you to be blessed. For those of you who are new, I'm Pastor Terry, lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church in San Francisco. You know, we're talking about, this is our series, Healthy Love. And what I want to explore in this time that we're sharing together is this understanding of how love protects, right? I want to talk about the way that love protects. I'm going to revisit 1 Corinthians 13, sit with it for a bit. But I just want to pray a blessing over all of us, you especially. Lord, I just ask that you would come among us and bless my friends. Bless us, Lord. Help us to be open to your grace and your love at work in our lives. Help us to be a people who are capable of walking in the way of love. Help us to allow your real presence in our lives to show up in meaningful ways so that we are affecting others with your goodness, that others are being built up rather than being torn down because of your love at work in and through us. So living Jesus, come among us, we pray, and open up your words to us on this good day. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. I want to visit it one more time. These first seven verses, at least. The apostle says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith, think about it, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. As we learned last week, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And what we want to look at today Love bears all things, believes all things. We talk about what that means. As for the love bearing all things, the word bear here in the original language in the Greek, literally the word stegi means to build a roof over. It can also mean to cover for the purpose of protection or concealment, which is why at least one New Testament translation, I think it's the Weymouth, renders the phrase, love bears all things as love is silent. That is, she can overlook faults. You see, when we have love, when we have Christ's love working in our lives, we're going to be less likely to exploit even when an opportunity presents itself, but rather our inclination, the dominant inclination of our life will be to help and to create a pathway for healing and Restoration. You know, that principle reminds us of a, of a wonderful verse in Proverbs 17, verse 9. Some of you are familiar with it, but not everyone would be. But we're told that whoever c covers an offense seeks love. But he or she who repeats a matter separates close friends. Isn't this so true? One of the things we're being told then is that love, not that it's secretive, but it is non-exploitive, right? It leans towards healing and shame reduction. When, it, when, it's, all, when it's at all possible, it, it's not trying to make people feel worse. It's trying to get them better, right? That's a goal of love. And uh, it's, it's a goal of someone who's walking in the, in the love of God as a, as a dominant theme of their life. And the other thing we're reminded of here is that love doesn't gossip. It doesn't try to damage others. It doesn't dwell on grievance and just keep talking about it. I mean, many things have been written about gossip and slander, by the way. And one of my favorites, and I just got a, a couple of them that stood out. One of my favorites, though, is that gossip, right? This repeating of a matter that separates friends. Gossip has just been described as halitosis of the mind, <laughs> That's great. Um, Shakespeare wrote that slander 
misrepresenting someone, undermining them to others. Slander whose edge is sharper than the sword, whose tongue outvenoms all the worms of Nile, whose breath rides on the posting winds and doth belie all corners of the world. It just travels well, doesn't it? It does when we speak poor words of people. Then there's Gail Carriger who wrote, I never gossip. I observe. And then I relay my observations to practically everyone, right? So we, just, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. And because remember, <laughs> the one who gossips to us will gossip about us. The one who gossips to us will gossip about us. The one who speaks poorly of others to us will speak poorly of us to others. Don't we need to remember that we do. And then there's this uh, little known acronym called think. And I think it's great. It's good medicine is aligned with the scripture and the Jesus way. It's especially helpful when we find ourselves in situations where we may, we may be tempted to speak reactively and say things we may later regret. This too, by the way, I have done. Boy, have I done that. <laughs> the words just came out. My feelings were strong. I was reactive. Instead of responding, I reacted and said things that did damage or that I regretted because they just weren't wise to say. The Lord wants to teach us how to live with restraint, how to speak mostly good words, certainly not negative death dealing ones, and not just to respond in because we're hurt or react. I should say when we're hurt, that often just makes things worse. But the acronym think T is it true? What we're saying, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspirational? That is positive. N, is it even necessary? And K, is it kind? Come on now, think <laughs> before we speak, especially about others, especially when we're hurt. And then there's my favorite. I call it the four monkeys. <laughs> All right. This is not my original, but I love it. If you didn't hear it with your own ears, and see it with your own eyes. Don't invent it with your small mind and share it with your big mouth. <laughs> That's, isn't that great? I mean, if you didn't hear it with your own ears and see it with your own eyes, don't invent it with your small mind and share it with your big mouth. Uh, boy, we could do that. We can, <laughs> we just need more restraint. Love restrains, love covers, love protects, it does. And to summarize kind of what we've been saying so far, Love leans positive. That's one. It cultivates a spirit of non-retaliation. That's two. And then it does its best to protect. That's three. Think about that. Those are the things that love does. It leans positive. It cultivates a spirit of non-retaliation and it does its best to protect. You know, the, this is no doubt the essence behind uh, a New Testament verse in first Peter four, eight, where it says above all keeping, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. You see the connection there to the verse that we had read earlier. And, you know, there are a couple of great examples in the scripture of how love covers a multitude of sins. And I was reminded of what happened with Joseph and Mary in the New Testament when Joseph sought to put away Mary privately when he found out she was pregnant because he didn't believe that it had anything to do with God. That's too incredible. He, he thought she had been unfaithful, but instead of retaliating, it says in Matthew one nineteen, and her husband, Joseph being a just man, that is a good man and unwilling to put her to shame. He didn't want to exploit. See, love doesn't exploit, right? He, he resolved to divorce her quietly. That was something. Now come on, someone may say, well, he, he also had himself in mind. That's true. But when love is injured, it, it just gets reckless. And Joseph wasn't reckless, was he? He was very thoughtful and caring. And um, I thought about an, an older Testament example about how love covers and doesn't exploit, but rather covers and protects. We're told about Shem and Japheth, how they dealt with their father, Noah, in the book of 
Genesis, way the beginning in the Older Testament. Genesis 9, verse 20 says this, Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine, and he became drunk, and he lay uncovered in his tent. It was kind of a shameful thing. He did some, something foolish. And it says, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and he told his two brothers outside. Right? He sort of exploited the situation. But then it says that Shem and Japheth took a garment, and they laid it on both of their shoulders. Look at this. How good is this? And they walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backwards. They didn't even see their father's nakedness. I mean, that passage is, is a fantastic passage because it reminds us of both what love does and what it does not do. Right? In this particular situation, the Ham, the son of Noah, was was in some way telling, revealing, exposing his father in a, in a way that it imply, is implied was dishonoring. But his two brothers, Shem and Japheth, they, they didn't want to exploit the situation. They were trying to help cover what was clearly a poor choice on the part of Noah and uh, their father. I mean, isn't, I mean, how good is that? I, you see how love seeks to cover and protect and not exploit. And the word we render cover or how love bears all things, love, and, you know, even this idea of covering uh, uh, another's faults uh, means to forbear, to bear with, to endure. And that's actually why Peterson in the message translations renders, renders it, you know, as only the message can, as love puts up with everything. Now, I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying that's the best render, but it does capture something about what love does when we say love bears all things. But remember what I mentioned earlier, how the original word in the Greek that the New Testament was written in carries with it this idea of a roof, like a, a covering over us, which is, and that's the primary meaning of the word that was used uh, that we render again, bear. You know, I've enjoyed watching this show called Alone, which some of you may be, have watched. I don't, I don't know, you wouldn't necessarily have done it. It's on the, I think it's on the History Channel. It's a survivalist competition. And one of the things that, uh, as I watch these people trying to survive in the wilderness that c keeps coming, well, it's, it's a common denominator. And it, it continues to show up as probably the most important part of surviving is the idea of shelter especially when the conditions are grueling or tough. I mean, that shelter is huge. In, in most cases, you can have enough food, but if you don't have shelter, you're in trouble. And um, you can even have, have water, but if you don't have shelter, you're in trouble. So, the, But if what it is a reminder of is what love does. Because what it does is, we're being told this, right? Love provides shelter. Love provides covering and protection. It's what parents do for their children. It's what we do when we love someone. It's not quick to expose and take advantage of a situation or a mistake just because the opportunity presents itself. Again, we alluded to that earlier. So mature love, though, and I need to say this as well. Otherwise, I could be misconstrued. And, and this is, remember, the Bible is about healthy love. <laughs> Mature, healthy love walks a fine line. It has to, especially when it comes to covering, right? Because there are times when covering something is precisely the wrong thing to do, hence the term cover-up in you know, Watergate. So some of you who know history, uh, Watergate is a classic example when the cover-up became greater than the crime itself and it ended up costing Nixon his presidency after his landslide victory and dooming him to be remembered as a kind of tarnished president. Even though he had some accomplishments, all he got remembered for was his sad ending. And it had to do with a cover-up. So obviously we need to be careful about things like becoming a codependent with people we love. So that's not what the kind of covering that love brings that we're talking about. Because it's certainly not talking about unhealthy love that covers as a way of enabling behavior that is destructive. It can't. You know, for some people, bad love is 
sadly, better than no love. But that's unhealthy love, right? And in the end, it brings pain and it does great damage to everything that it's connected to. So if I can kind of put it this way, love doesn't just close a blind eye. Love doesn't pretend something is okay when it's not. Love doesn't stay silent when words need to be spoken. Love doesn't do nothing when something needs to be done. I mean, that's where courage comes in. So when we talk about how love covers and how love conceals, how love protects, how love builds a roof, we're not talking, we're, we're not saying that, that, you know, we're supposed to accommodate wrong, especially if it's wrong as God's word defines it. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about concealing evil when in fact the most loving and right thing to do would be to reveal it. So there are, there are times when the most absolute loving thing is not concealing, but revealing, especially when it has to do with protecting the vulnerable. But, and this is the key. Stay with me, you guys. Stay with me. The key is, what is our motive and what is our goal? I mean, the Bible reminds us that when it's all possible, we should resist the temptation to exploit and retaliate. Just because the opportunity presents itself doesn't mean we should do it. Our goal should always be, loved ones, to seek, to help, and to heal. Because just this is, this is what Jesus' love is did and does for you and me. So there's this delicate balance when it comes to unhealthy love. Love doesn't try to conceal it, but there are a lot of faults and things that happen to people that are in our lives or sometimes even people that we may not even like a lot. Maybe we work with them and maybe they've hurt us that the temptation will be very real to undermine them, to, to go after them, especially when we find out that there's something that we could easily exploit, whether in our words, our positioning, and yet God's love, because it's the dominant theme of our lives, reminds us that we, that's not what love does. And that it, love desires at its core to, to cover, to heal, and to protect. So love bears all things, but we're also told here that love does what? It believes all things. And so we're reminded that love is positive, that its first inclination is to see things in the best light, that it refuses to, to go negative, and to turn cynical. This is really important. It's so important. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. I was reading a, a commentary uh, by uh, an older commentator of another era named, named Albert Barnes, and he wrote some words around this, this idea that love believes all things. And he said this. He says, the whole scope of the connection and the argument here requires us, just stay with me, to understand this of the conduct of others, this idea of believing all things. It cannot mean that the person who is under the influence of love is a person of universal credulity, that he makes no distinction or discrimination in regard to things to be believed and is as prone to, be believe, to believe a falsehood as the truth, or that he is at no pains to inquire what is true and what is false, what is right and what is wrong. So he's not saying we give everything a pass, we just believe everything. That's not what love does. It's not what love is saying. Uh, for us to do this, not what healthy love does, but it, it must mean that in regard to the conduct of others, look at this, stay with me guys, there is a disposition to put the best construction on it, to believe that they may be actuated by good motives and that they intend no injury. If I were summarizing what is being said here, if I wanted to get us to just really put a couple of handles on it, we put these two ideas together, what we are understanding is this, that love, number one, is slow to take offense. And if I can just connect that to the second thought here, that its first inclination is to grant positive regard. That is to believe the best. So love is slow to take offense. And its first inclination is to grant positive regard, to believe the best. So 
Instead of going negative, love works hard to stay positive. This is this idea of love believes all things. You know, the, the message uh, renders it love trusts God always. In other words, this kind of love is not dependent as much on people. It's not people dependent as much as it is God dependent, which is a way of placing the accent on God's faithfulness, which becomes the anchor of our positive outlook and our willingness to lean into the good. I mean, this is such an important thing I want us to get a hold of, right? In the same way that we say love bears all things and seeks to protect, this idea that love believes all things is a way of saying that we seek to, to stay positive and to give people the benefit of the doubt when at all possible. And in the same way that love bears all things doesn't mean that, that we become enablers or we don't expose something when it's clearly wrong or don't confront something when it needs to be confronted. And we're not talking about that. That's dysfunctional love. It's unhealthy love. But it's also true that this idea of love believes all things means that we really resist the inclination to go negative as a first move. We have to fight that. We have to fight this idea that there's an assumption that someone is, is in the wrong or that they've, they've had a bad motivation. We have to start with a, love, a place of love and accommodation as, as much as possible. We need to stay in a positive frame of mind that chooses to believe the best, not the worst people in our first move. Now, one of the things that, we, again, was mentioned earlier, that doesn't mean we're supposed to be so naive. It doesn't mean that uh, we're going to just <laughs> be okay with something and, and believe it and say, oh, I just want to stay positive when it's not a thing that we're supposed to be positive about. It's, it, once again, you, you see a balance here. You see, you see what we're getting at. How love, it, it's just when it's healthy, it leans in certain directions, doesn't it? It, it wants to protect. It wants to cover. It doesn't want to exploit. It wants to believe the best, not the worst. It doesn't mean it won't get there. It doesn't mean we won't have to confront things as they really are, but it makes us more trusting by nature. Some of us, we really struggle here. We are partly because we've been burned, you know, we've been burned. And when you're burned by people who should have loved you, it's hard to love well. A lot, of, a lot of our inability to trust is connected to trust injuries we've received. And that's why I said that everything about what we're being told here is connected to the, the idea that we're being anchored in the Lord. Like I can, I can live a life of trust. I can live a life of positive regard. I can live a life that chooses to protect and cover when at all possible and not shame people or exploit things or say that, oh yeah, that's just the way everybody is. I knew it, right? That we, we can trust because we, we find our lives anchored in Him, right? Our security is in God's faithfulness, not, not in things that are so flimsy or based on how people have treated us or let us down or hurt us or wounded us. We, when we start to grow in healthy love, what happens is we anchor ourselves in God's faithfulness. It's where, it's where our identity rests and resides. It's where our security comes from. And so I can risk, yes, I can risk um, being at a disadvantage. I can risk being hurt. I, I can risk being wrong about someone but it's better to risk first out of love than to and, and out of a positive regard than to, to start with being unloving, suspicious, and having a negative mindset that is cynical and skeptical because that's just not what we want to have at work in our own lives when it comes to our relationship with God. When we are living a life that is close to Him, we... 
which gives us that sense of security. We are basically free to love. That's what I'm saying, you guys. A life of trust allows us to trust others. And a life of trust and love allows us to trust others better. And even, listen, even when they disappoint us, and that will happen. And it will happen that, that there will be times when it's really hard to believe in someone when it doesn't look good. And it's, there are times where it's going to be really hard to believe in someone because they don't even believe in themselves. But, but God wants us to love them in such a way that, and, it, and I'm not saying, like you hear me, I know you've heard me, that there aren't boundaries, that there aren't times where we need to just say, this is the way it is and I need to address this because it's not getting better. But for the most part, our first move is to love in such a way that encourages people and to love in such a way that our first reaction isn't a negative one. And to love in such a way that we are calling out the best of what people can be and believe that God can work in their lives in a, mir in a miraculous way, that he is the God of, of miracles, right? He, he's transformative. And when we believe that, when, when we believe that the Lord can help us even when things are hard, that the Lord can help us even when we're at a disadvantage, that the Lord can help us when we're disappointed uh, to just stay in that place of love because that's what he's asked us to do. You know, that's the, that's the Jesus way. And it's the way that he wants us to walk. And, you know, the Lord sticks, come on now, the Lord sticks with us, doesn't he? The Lord trusts us even when we have been untrustworthy. The Lord loves us even when we probably, from a human perspective, aren't worth loving because we, we hurt him, we betray him, we, we ignore him, we disregard him, we disregard his ways, and yet he loves us still. If, if the Lord loves us this way, if the Lord wants the best for us, if the Lord doesn't rub our face in our shameful places. There's no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. Think about that. What, you know, God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into this world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. I mean, this is the idea that God is not a, his, his inclination is not to condemn and shame. Jesus took that on himself so that we might live a life free of shame, shame off you, not shame on you. And so if that's the case, then we need to be a people who offer that to others as well in his name. Love others, Jesus said. Love one another as I have loved you. Isn't that so good? Help us to do that better, Lord. You know, I've got another thought to share before we leave. This is going to happen after the song. I'm going to come back around. Uh, you know, I've got a little point of, of, of worship. And I, I love the, when we have a song to sit with because... It allows some of the things that we've shared to just settle in. It's designed to be a way of accenting and putting some emphasis behind the things that we've been talking about in God's word. But I do want to remind everybody, I get to do this. And I, I know for many of you, you're such a, a committed follower of Jesus. You're committed to this church. You're such a giving person. You give of your tithes and your offerings. And I am talking primarily right now. Yes, I am to those of you who are followers of the Lord and part of our community. And this is your church. So I don't want you to feel pressure if you're not, certainly if you're joining us for the first time or you're not even sure if you're a follower of Jesus, but I want everybody to feel welcome when it comes to giving. And remember, that's how we're able to do what we do in this way that we honor the Lord. So when it comes to giving a, of your tithes and your offerings, remember you can send those into our offices. You can give directly through our website, or you can go and get our app, uh, Cornerstone SF app, download it and give through the app. That's what I do. But like I always say, let us first give the Lord our hearts. Okay. With that in mind, let's share this song together, this worship time together. And then I'm going to come back around and close this out. So here we go.
drives out fear, conquers hate, never gives up, it's never too late. Don't see color, just sees heart. We need each other, it ain't that hard. It's four little letters, one little word. We all did better, a lot less hurt. Love people, love people. We all need love people. Underneath the surface, everybody's the same. Everything that could divide us, can we all set that aside? Just love people, love people. We all need Come up the same way, but we're all in need of the same grace. On our own, we won't make it far. If we ain't together, we're falling apart. So love people, love people. We all need love people. Underneath the surface, everybody's the same. Everything that could divide us, can we all set that aside and just love people, love people. We all need love people. Love is kind, love is all we really got Never fails, never leaves Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these Love people, love people We all need love people Underneath the surface, everybody's the same Everything that could divide us Can we all set that aside and just love people, love people Lord, help us to love well. Help us to love better. Help us to love one another the way you love us. Help us to love our loved ones the way you love us. Help us to be a people who protect, and I mean in healthy ways, who cover, who are willing to sacrifice because we love. That's what love doesn't look out for self first. Wow, no. It looks out for others especially the people we've been given to love well. I want to do that better. The best way to love better is to have more of His love at work in us. <laughs> There's no question about it. We start loving others better. We find that there's a unique joy that begins to flow into our lives of freedom. It's connected to the way of Jesus. And may the Lord help us also to love people who let us down, people who don't even treat us well, help us not to exploit because we don't like someone and we've got the opportunity to do it. Help us to love. Help us to love because love covers a multitude of sins, a multitude of separating grievances. Love is powerful. It's medicine for the soul. And it's my desire that His love would cover you and me too, right? So may He keep you in every way, in your spirit, in your soul, in your mind, and in your body. I pray it even now in Jesus' name.